Great. Good morning, everybody, and, and good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you all are. Uh, it's a real great pleasure to welcome you here to this project management training course um, that the current and emerging threats to crops innovation lab is presenting in collaboration with Michigan State University. Uh, my name is David Hughes, and I have the pleasure of being the director of this newly launched USAID current and emerging threats to crops innovation lab. And in this first session, what we want to do is to set the scene. Um, let me begin, first of all, by, by um, thanking Dr. Kalista Rachmatov, who has just been absolutely fabulous in organizing this course and taking a lead role. And she comes from Michigan State University and she is a global network specialist in the College of Ag Agriculture and Natural Resources. We in the current and emerging threats to crops innovation lab are extraordinarily happy and proud to have Michigan State as a partner, uh, principally because Michigan State have been working in international agricultural development for over 50 years and among the land grant universities are certainly leaders in this space. Uh, we are very, very happy to have Dr. Kareem Meredia, uh, who is a member of our, our team um, and has, has the ability to bring over 25 years of research and experience working in international agricultural development to bear with us. We're also going to hear from Dr. Angela Records, who is our principal point of contact with USAID, uh, herself a, a very well-regarded plant pathologist, and she's going to give an overview to the innovation labs more broadly. So we've been going since the 30th of September, 2021. So we're a very new lab and our lab has been set up in order to focus on current and emerging threats to crops. As we all unfortunately recognize globally, there are many current and emerging threats to crops. Um, we've really seen this because of the, the great stressors of things like fall armyworm, maize leaf necrosis, compounded by the multiple stressors uh, by climate change. And now the war in Europe uh, creates a whole new set of problems because of the limited supply of fertilizers, for example, or the compounding effects because of the reduced access to wheat coming out of Ukraine. So our lab is really emerging at a time when multiple intersections of threats happen. Uh, this is what the USAID administrator, Samantha Power, called um, interrelated and gargantuan threats. We've already had a kickoff meeting, and we're going to link that for you later on so you can look at what we talked about in our kickoff meeting. The purpose here though is very specific. We want to help our global community of partners, uh, both current and future, to better uh, compete for engagement with the Innovation Lab and particularly around the access to grants for completing research for development projects. It is a really important part of the uh, administra administration's framework that we engage better across all of the Feed the Future countries in which USAID works. We are particularly interested in engaging local organizations in the countries where we work and serve, and we want to enable them to more effectively compete for research dollars so that they can work locally and build up local capacity. So this three-day course will really focus on that. There's a, a wide range of different um, activities and instruction that we're going to engage in, but principally the whole point is to make you out there better at being a partner in both our lab, but also other innovation labs. And we'll hear about those other innovation labs shortly from, from Dr. Records. So it's a very practical course. Uh, we, we are trying to cover a lot in the three days, but then afterwards we're going to be posting all the recordings and we're also going to be linking to additional material that you can learn on your own. It's really important that 
uh, we provide a space and time for you to become aware. Certainly for us as a team, um, we're only now learning um, about many of the different aspects of running uh, an innovation lab. I just wanted to quickly mention our team uh, who are here. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Serge Quadrago, who is from, uh, who's our uh, Associate Director of the Innovation Lab and is from Burkina Faso. And Dr. Annalise Keyes, who is our Director of Operations. And then Melissa Ischler, who is our uh, Administrative Assistant. So all of them are here and uh, delighted to be part of, of this. So I'm going to stop talking now. Uh, this was just an overview to what we're trying to do. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Angela Records, who is going to provide us an overview of the, the great work that the broader community of innovation labs do. Uh, Angela, thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, David. And hello to everyone. Um, I am going to share my screen. And I'm going to make sure that it is showing the full slide. One second. Okay, and is are you able to see my my slides there? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you again. And and as David mentioned, I'm just going to give a brief overview of our Feed the Future research um, that we support at USAID um, and describe uh, the innovation labs just generally. So um, first, just to um, describe the Feed the Future program, this is a whole of US government effort around sustainably reducing global hunger and uh, malnutrition and poverty. And this initiative is implemented according to the global food security strategy. Um, so the, the whole of government approach is led by USAID in partnership with 11 other US government agencies and departments. And the program focuses on certain geographies and there's currently 12 target countries in the Feed the Future program. Um, that number is going to expand in the near future. Uh, and then there's certainly strategic engagement in aligned countries and regions. Uh, so just in terms of research and the role um, of research in achieving global food security, um, there's a recognition that research plays a critical role. And the Global Food Security Act, which is the law that mandates, um, that uh, um, codifies the work that we do, it mandates that our strategy harnesses science, technology, and innovation, including the research and extension activities supported by agencies and departments of the US government and state partners, and then the Feed the Future Innovation Labs are specifically cited. Um, we are currently working on a new global food security research strategy. This will be an annex to our um, global food security strategy. And that sets the research priorities and details how research will contribute to our goals. So just to give a quick um, sense of our research portfolio and the kinds of partners that we work with, so first, the Feed the Future Innovation Labs. Um, I'll talk a little bit about those in the a, in a next slide, but these are US university-led activities. There's a diversity of research themes that the different innovation labs focus on. And the innovation labs themselves um, give competitive subawards to national partners and others. Um, and then we, of course, work with the CGIAR, International Research Centers. They have a diversity of research and scaling programs. Um, and they also do uh, sub-award activities to partners. And then of course we engage with the private sector. So we have a number of public private partnerships, capacity development and training programs. And then we um, support uh, seed system activities to ensure that the crop varieties that um, our activities work on um, make it into the, into the hands of farmers. And then US, USAID, so I sit in Washington DC in our sort of our headquarters. But as many of you may know, USAID is a broad organization with, um, with uh, um, a presence in all the different countries where we work. Um, and this is through our USAID missions and they um, have their own budgets and their own um, goals and strategies. And they, um, they can fund um, research activities in support of the innovation labs and other programs. So the innovation labs, the idea here is to, for US universities to partner with the best and brightest minds around the world. 
Um, and it's a unique network um, supported by US, top US colleges and universities using cutting edge technology and research um, to develop technologies and innovations um, for the partners where we work. Um, and of course, this uh, key aspect to this is training. So um, the innovation labs provide short and long-term training um, to support the sustainability of these efforts. We currently have 21 innovation labs partnering with 620 local partners around the world. Um, some, you know, a handful of these or a, a good portion of these are academic institution, but the majority are non-academic local partners. Um, and the network of innovation labs is currently includes 71 US colleges and universities. 22 of those are minority serving institutions and they're located throughout the United States. Um, and this is just a map to kind of give you a sense of where the, the innovation labs are sort of headquartered um, across the United States and a sense of the different topics that the, the programs focus on. So of course, we're here today to talk about the current and emerging threats to crops innovation lab, which is led by Penn State University. Um, but there's a whole range of different innovation lab topics. Um, and then I just wanted to um, close here by just transitioning to um, how to find out about funding opportunities through the Feed the Future program. So any um, funding opportunity that's supported by the US government is posted at this website, grants.gov. Um, and then um, if it's an opportunity that's more for contracts, then there's the uh, FedBizOps website and the, the websites are there. Um, it's not always easy to find these opportunities. You kind of really have to search through the websites. Um, and uh, then that's for sort of major awards. But as we mentioned, and you'll hear a lot more about over the course of this training, there are sub award opportunities under some of these um, programs, including the innovation labs. And you hear about those just through your networks. Um, they're also, they're, they're not announced on grants.gov for the sub awards, but another good place to find this information is through the AgriLinks platform. Um, which I recommend that anyone who might be interested could should join. Um, this is a great platform to learn about all kinds of different opportunities, as well as different topics. There's all kinds of webinars and other things. And the link is there on this slide. Um, and so that's, I'll stop there and we'll be happy to answer any questions um, when the time is appropriate for that. And I'll stop sharing my slide. Great, thank you so much indeed, Angela. And it, it's really um, inspiring that we're part of such a broad community of actors, um, both here in the US at our land grant universities, but also internationally, uh, it, it's really impressive. And, and for those of you who are somewhat new to the innovation lab space, we will present the links uh, for you to easily access the information about them, but it is really um, impressive and inspiring to see the diversity of research activity, which is ongoing across the, the entire spectrum. Um, one thing we wanted to also mention is that there are, are 315 people registered for this course. Uh, later on, we'll find out all the, the various countries they come from, but it's really a, a testament to the ability to scale out teaching uh, such as we're doing here on Zoom. And it's, I'm really happy to see everybody then introducing themselves in the chat. So we next want to, to come to uh, Kareem, who is, has been a phenomenal partner so far, uh, principally because of his long experience in international development, but also coming from uh, Michigan State University, which is just a leader in this space. So it's, it's great to have Kareem here. So the floor is yours, Kareem. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, Kalista, maybe you can share the slide, please. Uh, so everybody, welcome to this uh, course on uh, project management, uh, Michigan State University. We are a land grant university like Penn State University and others. Uh, we are honored to be partner of the USAID uh, CETC uh, Innovation Lab Consortium. Um, we are actively engaged in collaborative research training and capacity building programs internationally. So this program, this training course on project management fits perfectly with our capacity building efforts uh, globally. Um, and uh, as uh, David mentioned, uh, Dr. Kalista Rakhmato, uh, who is with us today, uh, she has done a phenomenal job in, 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 in uh, 
putting together this entire course, working with so many of you, uh, and she is the manager of this course. Um, Kalista, please, you want to give a little overview of the program, please. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry about the mishap with the slide. Um, so I just wanted to go into a little bit of detail about the participants, um, who you all are. Um, as of Friday, we had 285 participants from 26 countries, and that number is increased by 30 over the weekend. So this, um, this breakdown is for the numbers that I had on Friday. Um, you can see that we had about 79% from Africa, 225 at the time, 10% um, from the US, North America, 8% um, from Asia, uh, about 2% from Latin America, and um, just a couple of people from, uh, from Australia and from Europe. Uh, and you can see that the, the breakdown from uh, Africa, most of the participants 100 from Kenya, and I believe that number um, is increased um, just based on a, a, a short glimpse of the participants that signed up over the weekend. So we have a, a very large representation from Kenya, um, also Burkina Faso, um, Ethiopia, et cetera. So you can see the breakdown here. And then from Asia, we have 10 from Nepal. I know that's one of our partner countries as well. And then Bangladesh, India, Thailand, and Vietnam. Um, so again, those numbers have shifted slightly over the weekend, um, and I can update this um, after, the, after the course. Uh, let us know if you have any questions about that. Um, so, uh, so for the program, we designed the program so that, we, that it would be the first day would be sort of what do you do before you get funded? Uh, how do you get funded? Uh, day one is setting the stage before the project. And then day two is all the things that happen during the project, including implementation and any problems that might crop up. And then the third day is communication and follow-up. So uh, sustainability, and then how do you communicate about your research, et cetera. So you all have the program. Um, it was sent to you uh, through Zoom. And then I know um, David also shared it in the chat. So let us know if you have any questions about the format. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about, um, first of all, this is the introduction, um, and then we're going to be talking about finding funding and writing a, a grant proposal. That's the next session. And then we have two sessions about designing the project. So that's today. Um, and again, let us know if you have any questions about that. Um, yes, yeah, so we have all the materials, all of the PowerPoint presentations and the recordings. They will be available. Um, both in the Google Drive and then on eventually on the Plant Village website. And the reason we're doing that is that we will that will allow you to interact after the course is over. Uh, so that'll be available at some point in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how long exactly that's going to take, but that will be available to you. So you can continue interacting with each other and with the speakers uh, after the program is over. We're also going to make the contact information of both the speakers and the participants available after the course as well. And we will be giving out a certificate of participation for everyone who is participating. And then also we want to send out a survey after the program to evaluate and also see how we can improve. Um, so just please be expecting that uh, later. And then I think it's back to you, Karim. Yeah, thank you, Kalista. You have done a marvelous job. So thank you very much. Very impressive. You know, if we get all 315 participants join, that will be incredible. I see 187 on the Zoom right now. Uh, so all of you, uh, we strongly encourage that you actively participate. Don't feel shy. Please ask questions. You can put it in the Q&A or chat box and so on. Uh, Michigan State University will continue to remain engaged in training and capacity building programs even after the course. Please feel free to contact Kalista or myself or the CETC lab on how best we can support you. Uh, and the goal of this program and other programs is to really form global resource network so that we can continue to share 
information, our expertise, our experiences, and so on. And I think all of us uh, recognize the importance of the networks. Yeah, networks are critical for capacity building efforts and also to form interdisciplinary research teams to make the innovation lab programs more effective with active participation from scientists on the ground in our host collaborating countries and make them more impactful. And lastly, uh, putting together this type of uh, courses and programs takes a monumental task. And so many people have been engaged and supporting Kalista and us. First, first of all, I want to thank USAID, uh, Dr. Angela Records, uh, for their support and the funding, uh, the entire CETC, uh, the Innovation Lab, uh, the program management team, uh, David and Serge and Annalise and Melissa and others. We also want to thank the, our interpreters and translators who have provided very good support. Our Michigan State University extension team, uh, Betsy Braid and Renee Siler are here with us. Uh, they will be providing us the support of the IT and the Zoom. Uh, Kalista has done an excellent job. And all the panelists and all the resource faculty that are providing us support over the next three days. Uh, and lastly, all of you, all the participants for participating, taking your time and participating in this. So we hope uh, we'll have a very good, interactive, productive program over the next three days. And we wish you all the best. Thank you. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so please, um, and Kalista, if you can moderate the Q&A, please. Sure, no problem. Yeah, so now is the time for, for you all to ask questions. Um, when we last did a meeting like this, um, it really ramped up quickly. So the quicker we get to, to questions, um, the more engaged you'll feel in the whole process. While we're waiting for a question, I just wanted to emphasize um, the new world we're in after two years of COVID with remote working and engagement. Uh, it is now possible and easy and trivial to engage hundreds of people around the world. And we saw from, from Calista the representation from Africa. Uh, it's, it's possible to engage many young people, young researchers in these meetings very easily and with very little effort. We wanna make sure that as we come out of COVID, uh, we take advantage of these things. So we truly do democratize the access to knowledge and we truly do engage uh, the global community of researchers and, and link those researchers in Feed the Future countries with the incredible talent we have in the land-grant universities uh, here in the United States, such that we can, we can have excellent synergism. So that's a really important point that have come out. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that um, a lot of people on the call are very young, and um, I'm always always reminded of what the African Development Bank president, uh, Akin Adesina, all, often says nowadays, is that the, the, the young people are not the future, that are present. Um, so this is really important for you to take the full advantage of this course, learn how to effectively apply for and run and manage a project uh, so you can be the drivers of change. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of questions. The first one is, how does someone contact the current and emerging Threats to Crops Innovation Lab? Great. Um, so we have a website uh, where we're going to put now in the chat. And on the website, there is a form that one can fill in for expressing an interest in doing a project. We want to make it as easy as possible for people just to put forward their ideas and get an understanding about whether the idea fits in. Then after you put in that information on the website, then we have a meeting with you in a very short period of time. We're looking at less than two weeks, and that will just be an opening conversation in order to determine uh, is the project suitable? Uh, how can we help you develop it further? How can we help you find a partner perhaps elsewhere, uh, ideally from a land-grant university that you can partner with 
So this is um, the, the process. And we hope that even if you don't get funding, you will have learned uh, a number of components for effectively applying for research funding. So we wanna make sure that every step along the way, you can get training and that enables you to be better. Uh, you're very welcome to write to us in any language you want. Um, we have a, a multilingual uh, group of people, so we'll answer you in your own language and we can put that uh, on there. I think, um, yeah, that's the answer to that one. Okay, next question. Hi, I am working at Summit Bangladesh under CSISA MEA project. My understanding is that in-person training is much more effective. Is there a chance that you will organize this kind of training in person? Yes, we, we certainly wanted to do that in the first year and we had uh, plans to do that. So, so certainly going forward, we're gonna have a blended approach. We're gonna have both in-person training and virtual uh, training. Um, but I, I think we, we also need to recognize that in-person training uh, can also be uh, somewhat exclusionary um, because there's a large number of individuals who would not be able to get a visa to go to a, a US or European country if that's where training was, or a large number of individuals who, if the training is going to be in a country like Kenya, uh, perhaps even are not invited or, or, or part of it. Um, so we wanna make sure that we take advantage of the capabilities that are inherent in virtual training to open the door wider. One of the things we often speak about is who's not in the room. And, and we wanna make sure that we can have this framework whereby lots of people can apply to be part of a meeting, maybe, Many people haven't turned up today because of connection issues, which are a huge problem uh, in many of the countries we serve, but they will be able to see the recording. And then by virtue of the fact of having the, um, by virtue of the fact of having the recordings available, then people can watch them later on. So, so we certainly take the point that in-person is great, um, but, but a, a hybrid model would hopefully be better. Thank you. Thank you. So someone asked about the agenda. Um, we posted it in the chat again, and um, it was also sent via email. Um, so you should have that. Let us know if you have trouble with that. Um, the next one is, do you have incubation and acceleration programs? Uh, could the speaker, did the questioner perhaps expand upon that? Um, it, do they mean a residential program or what, what perhaps do they mean? I think that might be having to do with technology, um, like developing technologies and incubating them. I, I'm not entirely sure. Usually an incubator program is the kind of thing you would see in the startup space. So Y Combinator or Google would have incubator programs. You could spend uh, six weeks and you're learning all about uh, launching a startup. I suppose for this, we'd have an incubator program where people would learn about projects. Um, that could be a very good idea. It, so it could be something that would come out of this um, and we'll see. I think uh, Victor um, was talking about this. If you have anything to add beyond that, one nice idea was having our own WhatsApp group that somebody else mentioned. And, and that could be a way in which we would continue the training beyond this. But we're very, very flexible and adaptive. So if it comes to, to be that an incubator program is important, we can we can expand that and see what value people get from it. But at the moment, we haven't designed or implemented or, or thought about having an incubator program. Okay, thank you, David. Um, someone, is, um, someone is asking if we can have an official WhatsApp group so they can get updates. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, we, we certainly have many, many WhatsApp groups um, ourselves as an innovation lab. Um, one example would be uh, to enable the daily communication and effective working together for research for development between um, uh, uh, Dr. Marisol Quintanala at Michigan State University, a nematologist and experts that we have at the Dream Team Agro-Consultancy Group, which is in Kenya, uh, particularly Matthew, Victoria, and Tracelyn 
in that case, they have real-time communication. So WhatsApp has certainly proved its capability. Uh, we may be limited uh, given the size of the, the, the people we can have in a, in a group, but it's certainly something that we can set up for informal sharing of ideas between people. We do have a newsletter and I know people have um, put um, some links to our site. So we, maybe we could put the newsletter link and you could sign up for the, the newsletter, which is run by uh, doc, uh, by Mercy Tata and her team. Uh, and that really gives you an ability to have updates regularly. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there a plan to expand the organization's outreach to West African farmers? Yeah, maybe uh, let's search, take that uh, if you'd like, search. Sure. In in West Africa, we already uh, working in in Burkina Faso, where we have some project ongoing with the Feed the Future Innovation Lab with Inera Burkina Faso, and also we uh, previously the Plan Village has a dream team that working with Burkina Faso farmers. But we are really open with the new RFA. If you go in the website and you work in, in any West African country that's supported by the Feed the Future Innovation Lab, you can submit your your uh, request for applications there and you can uh, present your idea write two or three paragraphs and send it to us and feel free to write it also in french if you would like to so both language in english or french you can explain your idea what you want to work on and the emergent uh, the uh, the current and emergent emergent threats you want to work on and just explain it to us and we will be contacting you to have a meeting to talk about your idea and move forward with uh, the implementation. And if we can also link you with some other people working in the same area. So feel free to contact us in any, in any language, in French or in English, the language that you are comfortable with, and we will be following up with you. But presently we already have a project ongoing in Burkina Faso on, on fruits on, and vegetable crops. And also with the dream team working with farmers to build their capacities in knowledge and in, in different areas. Thank you. Thanks, Serge. Okay, so there are 12 focus countries in the Feed the Future Innovation Lab. Do you deal with the same product, for example, fall armyworm in all the countries or specific products in the different countries? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, and it's certainly our intention to leverage the, the platform approach so that if we are working on say fall armyworm, a pest in Kenya, and we're also experiencing high levels of fall armyworm in Nepal, which we do, um, then how can we work with our partner, ICIPE, who are uh, an international group focused on pest control? How can we work with them and the local government to implement the innovations? Now, the innovation that we find is very successful for fall armyworm is the release of parasitoid wasps, but also an IPM package. And so we want to make sure that we have this um, ease of moving across countries and sharing ideas. And a large component of our innovation lab are, are, are these young people like Bonfus who asked this question. Um, they have the ability to communicate via our WhatsApp channels across borders. Uh, they also do physical trainings between different countries. Mm -hmm. And we find that this is a very effective way uh, to share the results, for example, the control of fall army worm in Kenya. And that leads to groups in other countries seeing that and saying, can I have that here? How do we get that acting? We're seeing that between Kenya and Uganda, Kenya and Nepal and other locations. So that's the, the strong advantage of a platform technology and something we really want to keep on implementing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Richard is saying, thanks for the opportunity. I hold a bachelor's degree. Is there a chance for further studies or scholarships under Feed the Future? Yes, uh, both in, in our lab, uh, the current Emerging Threats to Crops Innovation Lab, but, but across the wide spectrum of the 21 innovation labs that, that Angela mentioned. Um, there is a an enormous value addition that comes from training in the United States, um, obviously in terms of excellence in research, 
but it also um, leads to a wide variety of soft skills uh, that are very, very valuable. We want to balance this um, with, with um, avoiding maybe historical examples of a brain drain from these countries. We want to, we want to not just have a, a selected chosen few come over, but we want to be able to expand the opportunity. So one way is sandwich courses. If a person is doing a degree, uh, like a master's degree or a bachelor's of science degree, or even PhD in a country, they could come for a short period to a, a, a land grant university, for example. Um, and we also want to see if, if people can do research remotely. So, so as I mentioned, um, Marisol Quintanala at Michigan State, she's a very effectively working on advanced research on nematology with people on the ground. And, and maybe for year two, one idea is that she could have a PhD student based in the United States who would be working and helping capacity building in all these countries. So the answer is yes, uh, but not exclusively. We want to make sure we expand the opportunities so we can get as many people as possible uh, having their capacity increased. Thank you. Thank you. So we had a suggestion that um, we type our answers into the chat box uh, because of um, a low connection. So that might be a little difficult for us to do. So what I've done is I've asked Renee to turn on the live transcript. So hopefully that helps. Um, you can always go back and watch this later. So if um, the connection is not good right now, um, we are answering the questions, we're recording it, and we'll post the video later. So that might be an option. We could also potentially type some things up later, but right now I don't think we can do that live. Um, some of the questions we will be able to uh, answer in the chat, but, but not all of them. So we've got about five more minutes left and we have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, uh, what does it take for a country to be considered in the innovation lab? I don't know if you'd like to answer this, Angela. Sure, I can um, talk broadly about the sort of the Feed the Future Innovation Labs collectively, and then maybe David, you could talk a little bit about you know how you see that in your program. Um, but so I mentioned that there are currently 12 focus countries um, for the Feed the Future program. And that list is um, kind of under expansion right now. Um, there are um, smart folks in our um, in our bureau at USAID who look at various factors that um, that um, suggest that a, a particular country would be a good um, you know place for us to focus our our activities. Um, and there's a, a list of things they consider. Um, you know, obviously the need and the opportunity. Um, the, you know, the relationships that um, that our agency and and, and others you know have with um, entities in the host country. Um, so, but um, having said that, our programs work in a broader range of countries than just the Feed the Future countries. So um, we may focus on those countries, but our activities certainly have the um, opportunity to work in other um, locations, just depending on, on the program and, and the rationale for that. And, and I'll turn it back to David to speak specifically about this program. Great. We thank you very much. We have uh, four regions: uh, Central America and the Caribbean. So that's uh, Honduras, Guatemala, and Haiti. And we're focused on Honduras. And then West Africa had uh, about six countries. We're focused on Burkina Faso, East Africa, and Southern Africa. We're focused on Kenya. And then in Asia, it we're focused on Nepal, and Bangladesh is the other Asian country. So as you look at the map on our site, but also elsewhere. If you're in one of those other countries, you're welcome to just reach out to us, as Serge mentioned, and then we can then evaluate your proposal and help you get it funded or talk about its suitability. So please just reach out to us and we'll have that conversation. Uh, we also want to have people reach out to us for issues beyond uh, the countries of focus because many of the problems are transboundary. And, and the pests don't know borders. So please do reach out to us in either way and, and start that conversation sooner rather than later. Thank you. 
Okay, great. This is the last question uh, for this session before we move on to the next one. And it is, why are we worrying about emerging threats as we are living with several existing threats that we need to address right now? Uh, so what a super question to ask. Um, unfortunately, the answer is because although we think things are bad now, uh, they will get worse um, and they will get enormously worse. This is the reality. The way in which we set up our innovation lab was to recognize that the next 10 years will be the, among the worst 10 years in humanity's history. We're growing food at a temperature of 1.1 degrees above historical norms. And over the next 20 or 30 years, we will likely go to 1.5 and then maybe two. That means that the last 10,000 or 12,000 years of agricultural development, the plants will have to grow in an environment that they have never evolved to grow in. And they've evolved through the process of artificial selection. So that's one problem. The, the climate change is creating uh, an environment where plants are unable to cope effectively. This is compounded by biotic stressors. We do not know how bad mealybugs or fall armyworm or wheat rust or viral diseases will be with the effect of climate change. But we all know personally that when we're stressed, for example, studying for an exam, that's when we're more likely to break out, get a cold, for example. That's called context-dependent virulence. And so the interaction between the enormous stressor of climate change with the existing stressors of biotic diseases and then compounded by globalization, meaning more diseases are spread, means the next five and 10 years um, will unfortunately uh, be the worst we've ever experienced. And so the emerging threats will be huge. And that's unfortunately the reality we have to deal with, but a good question. Okay, that's it. Um, thank you very much. So now we can move on to our next session, which is how do you find funding and how do you get that funding? <laughs> so.